fairy tale romance ruined by greed. He wanted to not have to share the money with her. But I've never seen someone so obsessed with money. A divorce settlement turned deadly. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe he went through this far so he wouldn't be intercepted. The thing that concerned me was it just showed the incredible amount of forethought that went into to how you would do this. To part with money uh, was unacceptable to him. He placed a dollar limit on his wife's life. A miserly millionaire protecting his fortune at any cost. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Two police officers in a surveillance van videotaped millionaire businessman Joel Sandler walking through the parking lot at the King of Prussia shopping mall outside of Philadelphia. But shopping is the last thing on Sandler's mind. In fact, Joel Sandler hates to part with money. A shrewd investor, Sandler built a fortune in real estate and the stock market. But he's a notorious cheapskate cracking his wallet only for the bare necessities. Now, the millionaire's fortune is at risk. Sandler is locked in a contentious divorce battle with his wife, Linda, a divorce that could end up costing him millions. He feared losing his house, his money, um, more than he did losing his wife. Money. Money was Joel's primary uh, interest in life. And as a result of the divorce, he was going to have to part with at least 50% or more of multi-million dollars worth of assets. Sandler is at the mall to meet a hitman and make a deal with him to kill his wife. But what Joel Sandler doesn't know is that the supposed contract killer he's meeting is really an undercover cop. The police had been tipped off to his plan. A person contacted uh, my detectives and said, Sandler asked him if he knew a person that could be persuaded to commit a murder. And I decided that we would use one of our undercover narcotics officers uh, to pose as a, uh, as a potential hitman. And what we're trying to do is ascertain is his true intent to commit a killing, and if so, then we're going to make an arrest uh, for solicitation to commit murder. The undercover officer follows Joel Sandler to his car to discuss the details of the hit. I mean, we did have a script in our mind of what was going to happen, and I try to really lay things out when I, I do anything undercover in my head on what's going to happen. They get in the car, and Sandler begins the conversation. I want something done, and I was put in touch with you. It looked like the police had Joel Sandler on Tate, trying to hire a hitman, and that the millionaire's goose was cooked. But this guy was no dummy. If anyone knew how to save his own bacon, it was Joel Sandler. Joel Sandler wasn't born rich. He grew up the only son of a middle-class family in Long Island, New York. Sandler was expected to follow his parents' wishes and pursue a career as a doctor. But after graduating from the University of Pittsburgh in 1972, he turned his back on medical school. The headstrong young man decided that the pursuit of wealth and money was his true calling. That same year, while still searching for his path to riches, Sandler stumbled upon the love of his life. He was working a construction job in Philadelphia and stopped in at a diner. He spotted a girl sitting alone and introduced himself to her. Linda wasn't the kind of girl strangers usually cross the room for. She was shy, quiet, and had never had a serious boyfriend. But Joel was smitten. He came up to her, and he they just started talking. And she said, you would never know it now looking at him, but he was very attractive and charming and persuasive. And he basically just swept her off her feet. And I got the feeling she was a very insecure woman. Joel took Linda's phone number and called her before she even got home. An intense romance followed. 
and within two years, Joel and Linda were married. Two children followed soon after. Joel Sandler seemed to have the perfect family, and soon he landed the perfect job, stockbroker at Merrill Lynch outside of Philadelphia. The world of high finance suited the ambitious young man to a T. Talented and shrewd, Sandler established himself as an aggressive broker with good financial instincts. Soon, he was pulling in a salary of more than $150,000 a year. But the young broker's blind obsession with money won him few friends at Merrill Lynch. After numerous complaints from co-workers that Sandler was too abrasive, his boss arranged to have him transferred to another office. And he wanted to take his clients with him, and his boss wouldn't let him. So according to Linda, he threatened to kill his boss. And that's when they fired him instead of transferring him. What drives him the most is a need to control everything and every person around him. And when he can't control them, he erupts into anger. Sandler didn't just lose his job. He lost his reputation. No one in the investment banking world would hire him. But in 1978, he secured a position with an upscale real estate firm and began brokering investment deals for wealthy families and corporations. The real estate boom of the 1980s quickly pushed Sandler's income to more than $500,000. Sandler's life in the 80s was very good. It is my understanding that he amassed fortunes that he put together large deals uh, using tax shelters. He was very good at what he did, like cobbling together these real estate deals, and he had made so much money. Flush with cash. In 1985, Joel Sandler purchased a half-million-dollar home in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, one of the ritzy and exclusive Philadelphia suburbs collectively known as the Main Line. Sandler dubbed his new estate the Gables. Uh, the Main Line is the most affluent area in the state and one of the most affluent areas in the United States. The Sandlers lived in one of the most prestigious areas of the Main Line in the Philadelphia suburbs. And they didn't live in a home, they lived in a mansion. Joel Sandler had achieved everything in life that anybody could want. He made millions of dollars. He had a wife. He had two wonderful children, a beautiful mansion. He had everything. Philadelphia's main line is a place for the haves and the have-mores. And from the outside of their perfectly manicured estate, the Sandlers seem to fit right in. But behind the Gable's impressive facade, trouble was brewing in 1985 joel sandler seemed to have it all millions in the bank spectacular house beautiful wife and two accomplished children it appeared to be a life others would envy it looked like the picture-perfect home because you had the daughter who was a figure skater and the son who was a tennis player and make you know he was a very good tennis player mom was a school teacher dad you know did this wheeling and dealing privately they lived in this beautiful mansion on the main line one of the wealthiest areas in the country he had a really busy full life but sandler couldn't enjoy all this newfound wealth and privilege his obsession with money only intensified Joel Sandler was the cheapest millionaire you've probably ever heard of. I mean, a lot of people joke that that's how you keep your money, but he went above and beyond. He was known to, to turn the hot water off at the house if he felt somebody was taking too long of a shower, just concerned with a dollar. He would just get free subscriptions to newspapers, and as soon as the free subscriptions ran out, he'd get a free subscription from another one. He'd drive up to the pump at a gas station and then leave before paying. He was frugal to the point where you would think that they had no money, that they were, in fact, poor or destitute. In wintertime, Sandler wouldn't turn the heat on and instead had his family huddle in front of the fireplace to stay warm. If you don't think that's too unusual, it was also reported that he urinated into a cup and flung it out the window to save on the water bill. The family's financial situation was about to be severely stressed. In 1991, the tax loopholes that had allowed Joel Sandler to make a fortune brokering real estate deals were finally closed. The half million dollar a year salary was gone. Joel needed a new job. Enterprising as ever, Sandler opened his own brokerage company, Sandler & Associates. 
but there were no associates. Sandler was the only employee. He may have been good with money, but he was bad with people. Drumming up clients proved to be a difficult task. I think that he just couldn't do it because he had such a weird, creepy personality. He has these deep eyes that just stare holes into you. And he's grim and he's brooding and he's just someone who gives off the creepiest air. I mean, I wouldn't want to deal with him on a professional level. Uh, Sandler and Associates was Mr. Sandler working uh, by himself uh, in his basement out of his mansion. He was still putting together deals. He was acting as a broker. He was, in fact, uh, still from time to time making money, even though it had dramatically dropped off. In 1992, desperate to keep the money coming in, Sandler began investing in real estate all around the country and day trading in the stock market. He still had the Midas touch. The money-hungry millionaire was quietly amassing a fortune. But just how much he made, he never told anyone, not even his wife. Linda was a, was a traditional uh, housewife and the parent that raised the children. And she didn't really know very much at all about the finances. Joel Sandler's new investments were extremely volatile. Playing the stock market meant tremendous risk. And as the market fluctuated each day, so did Joel Sandler's mood, which began to turn abusive. It, his temperament would rise and fall according to whether he made or lost money that day. If he made money, everything was great in the house. If he lost money, you know, watch out, because he could be coming after Linda. He mainly hit Linda. He'd elbow her in the stomach or actually physically hit her just because he was in a bad mood because he didn't make money that day. She would get um, an elbow in the stomach if she didn't use a coupon for shampoo. Joel's behavior got even worse. Not only was he hitting his wife, he also became a petty thief. In the mid-1990s, he was arrested on at least four occasions for shoplifting. His ill-gotten gains included cigarettes, a $100 sweater, and nearly $1,000 worth of lawn care products. Sandler once refused to pay a house painter the agreed-upon price. When the painter told him, you have no principle, Sandler replied, the only principle I have is in the bank. By the summer of 1998, Joel Sandler's investments began to stagnate. The money that used to pour in had slowed to a trickle. Joel's frustration reached a fever pitch, and he turned his anger on Linda. And the worse and worse his money situation got, the more violent he got with her. And it escalated until September 98. He picked her up and threw her across a room. And she was just, at that point, she just realized she had to get out of there, that his behavior was getting worse and worse. It was the straw that eventually broke the camel's back and ended their marriage. And that's when she fled the family home. Linda Sandler was terrified for her safety. She fled to the family's beach house on the Jersey Shore and filed for divorce. First and foremost, she was seeking to get peace of mind and to be separate and divorced from Joel. That was the most important thing. But in addition, she wanted her fair share of the assets. Joel would have to actually part with some of his money. Linda would now be going after the one thing her husband cherished most, his bank account. He could let go of his marriage, but Joel Sandler was going to hold on to his fortune at any cost. In September of 1998, after nearly 25 years of marriage, Linda Sandler had had enough. She fled the family's mainline mansion and filed for divorce. She was seeking more than half of the couple's $4.5 million estate. But Joel Sandler wasn't about to give Linda one dime without a fight. Divorces are rarely um, peaceful, but I think the Sandler divorce was made even more acrimonious because Jan Joel Sandler was so cheap and money meant everything to him. Linda Sandler was going to be entitled to a lot of what they had, and I think that bothered him more than her leaving him, the fact that she was going to get his money. Joel was totally uninterested in settlement, uh, whereby Linda would get a share of the assets. He ignored our settlement proposals entirely, didn't make any counterproposal, so it appeared to us that Joel simply had no interest in dividing the assets with Linda at all. But losing his money in a divorce was not the only thing that scared Joel Sandler. 
While playing the stock market in the mid-90s and earning a small fortune, the greedy millionaire had pushed his luck with the IRS. He hadn't paid income tax in more than three years. Joe was deathly afraid because he believed that it was going to come out that he had committed uh, fairly egregious tax evasion and that he would end up in jail and that he would owe the government hundreds of thousands of dollars. Joel sent Linda a letter begging her not to go through with the divorce. No sweet nothings here. He just wanted to save the family fortune from the IRS. Let's just say Linda was not exactly moved. Linda was living at the couple's New Jersey beach house with their daughter. She soon came to believe that Joel was stalking her. I think you can see the controlling part of his personality really start to emerge once Linda left him because she talked about her tires getting slashed in her car at the beach. There was a public confrontation at a restaurant where the cops had to be called because he came down there and confronted her. Joel was constantly calling her, uh, allegedly came to the shore house and changed the locks, and we had to file an emergency petition to get Linda exclusive possession of the property so she'd have some peace of mind separate and apart from Joel. During one of the occasions at the beach house, they had entered the elevator to go up to, uh, to the apartment. And at that point, the elevator had the heavy smell of intense smoke, uh, Mr. Sandler being a chain smoker. Her daughter knew immediately that her father had been in that elevator just briefly before they were. Linda became terrified, even though she was 70, 80 miles away from him. She was terrified of the reach he had and the obsessiveness he had. And the beha behavior continued to escalate to the point where she really felt her life was in danger. And that's why she decided to vanish. In February of 2001, more than two years after she'd left her husband, Linda Sandler packed her bags once again and disappeared. Afraid for her life, she told no one where she was going, not even her two college-age children who'd also cut ties with their father. Even in hiding, Linda continued to push for a divorce settlement, but Joel wouldn't play ball. He dug in his heels and refused anything that required him to carve up his fortune. Virtually every issue in the case had to be decided by the judge as opposed to by agreement. Uh, nothing was able to be resolved uh, unless we filed a motion with the court. Joe wanted everything done on his terms, his way, and in his order. But even Joel Sandler couldn't hold back the law forever. In February of 2001, more than two years after Linda filed for divorce, the court took over. If Joel couldn't learn to share, a judge would divvy up his assets for him. When the court issued a notice scheduling a hearing on the property division, he must have realized that he could no longer avoid the inevitable, which was a, that he was going to have to give up a share of the assets. It seemed almost certain that Joel Sandler was about to be ordered to hand over millions of dollars to his estranged wife. But he wasn't willing to go down without a fight. The penny pincher hatched a new plan. One that would ensure he kept every last cent. In February 2001, Joel Sandler contacted a former neighborhood acquaintance named Michael Saul and asked him to lunch. Saul was a known gambler and Sandler mistakenly believed he had underworld connections. While sitting at a diner in the Philadelphia suburbs, Sandler told Saul he had a problem that needed solving. Mr. Sandler indicated that he wished to have someone taken out. And Mr. Saul was taken back by that. He immediately understood what Mr. Sandler was asking. He immediately began to brush away with his hands, indicating, leave me alone, get out of here. Mr. Sandler mistook that gesture as placing his hand out. And Mr. Sandler grasped and shook Mr. Saul's hand. And Mr. Sandler left the restaurant. Michael Saul was convinced that Joel Sandler thought he was hiring a hitman. He immediately contacted the police and told his story to detectives. I believe Mr. Saul. It was clear that he was certainly bothered by what he had experienced. And he wanted to, to do the right thing. We started looking into some of Mr. Sandler's affairs. There were a lot of indicators that there could be a problem in this particular case. 
The investigation immediately revealed that the divorce was not going well for Mr. Sandler, that he was dragging his feet, that there was a large and substantial amount of money which would be necessarily broken up in a divorce situation. And it became very clear very quickly that we had to react. Convinced that Joel Sandler was trying to have his wife killed, the district attorney contacted Linda's lawyer, Rob Fetter, and told him that his client's life might be in danger. I was totally stunned and shocked. Linda herself was not surprised. She felt that he was capable of doing anything if it would protect his money. But the police had no proof that Joel Sandler was trying to have his wife killed. Until they had some hard evidence, there wasn't much they could do. Essentially, we looked at one another and said, hey, what are our options? And we more or less came up with two. Uh, we had the option of banging on his front door and say, hey, Mr. Sandler, um, don't kill your wife. You know, if that's what you're thinking of, it's not a good idea. Uh, the only other option that we collectively thought we had was extend the opportunity to him and see what happens. And we decided to basically reestablish a contact with Mr. Sandler as though uh, his request had been honored by Mr. Saul. In mid-March 2001, detectives sent a letter to Joel Sandler that said, someone will be in touch. Don't ever ask me for anything else. It was signed with a single letter M for Sandler's old neighborhood acquaintance, Michael Saul. Sure enough, Joel got a phone call from a man offering to help him with his problem. The two agreed to meet. Sandler had taken the cop's bait, but reeling him in would prove to be more difficult than they ever imagined. In late March 2001, Millionaire Joel Sandler believed he was closing in on the perfect divorce settlement. He could keep it all, the gated mansion and the millions in cash, all for the price of Linda's life. But what Sandler didn't know was that the hitman he was about to meet was actually an undercover cop. The police were closing in. The immediate objective in an investigation of this sort is to protect the public and specifically protect the intended victim. One of the things that, uh, that you're most concerned about is Sandler is out there and you don't know what he's doing, so the uh, impetus on us was to move as rapidly as we could to get to a resolution where we could make the arrest. The cops thought they had Sandler on a string and it looked like his time was running out. But this guy knew how to slip a noose as the police were about to find out. On March 28th, 2001, plain clothes officers and a police surveillance van set up in the parking lot of the King of Prussia Mall outside of Philadelphia. The goal of that meeting with Joel Sandler was to get as much information on who his target was, what he planned to have done, also to figure out if he was serious, if this is what he wanted to do, that he, he was meeting me, to have someone killed. The team was ready to confront Joel Sandler. Just after 3 p.m., an undercover officer wearing a tape recorder met Sandler in a restaurant. Not only did he want Sandler to start talking, he wanted him to do it outside, in range of police surveillance cameras. As I went in there, I saw him, he was casually dressed. I could tell that he, had a, he already had his own plan. He had his own script. I had one and he had one as well. So I had to try to get him outside the restaurant. What's up? Joe? What's up? Now come here, I'll talk to you out here for a minute. I'm not meeting with you in a public place like this. We'll go sit in the car. I'm not doing this. No. You said we were meeting here. You said we meet outside. You're not changing the thing, huh? I don't know you, dude. I don't want to be videoed out there or anything like that. I don't want a bar, I don't want a bar full of people saying that you, they saw you with me. There'll be nobody that will do it. Sit at the table and talk to you. I'll sit. I don't do things this way. I don't do things this way. This is goofy. This is disgusting. I thought you were on the up and up. I'm not doing it. I'm not playing games. I had to force him to come outside. Finally, I said, I'm leaving. This is not going to work, and he stopped me. Sandler agreed to continue the conversation in his car. But once they got inside the Toyota Camry, Sandler unveiled an enormous surprise. I want something done, and I was put in touch with you. I just want to talk any further, okay? Instead of conversing with the would-be hitman, 
Sandler produced a series of pre-typed index cards. Now he could work out the details of the murder without uttering a word. He used index cards that anticipated every potential question and every potential answer that a hitman could have asked him. The cards proceeded to indicate that he wished to have something taken care of, that it was someone out in the West, that it was potentially a business associate that he wished to have the victim disposed of. The thing that concerned me with the, the cards was it just showed an incredible amount of forethought that went into to how you would do this, to prepare a negotiation but do it in a, in a way that they wouldn't have to speak. The fact that he had had the index cards typed up like that reinforced our greatest fears. He wished to have someone killed. The index cards, I wasn't sure how I was going to overcome that. I knew that the longer I talked to him, he would have to say something. I had to outthink the cards. I assumed that once things started to go, that something would slip, that he would, he would say a name, he would say a location, a gender, um, that he needed someone murdered. Are we going to write this way the whole time we're doing this business? Because this is a little crazy. As we were sitting in the car, and the cars kept coming and coming and coming, I, I was concerned that I wasn't going to be able to get them run out of cars. I got a phone call that, you know, some guy needs this, this, that, and the other thing. You know, something, to, a problem to take care of. Now we're here, you're not talking at all. I need more particulars. This car thing is not going to work. He had a car for everything. And he was controlling the conversation, which those cars were already in order. So as I went through a different road, he had a card. If he had to rearrange the cards, he had a card. He knew exactly where this, this meeting was going to go. I need to get him to talk. He may have been arranging a hit, but Sandler never named the target. In fact, the police didn't have him saying much at all. Just as it looked like Joel Sandler held all the cards, the detective figured out how to get the tight wad to finally talk. I knew that he... He was concerned about money. The reason that he was meeting with me was money. I figured if I could get him to talk about how much this was going to cost, that it was going to come out, that he wasn't going to let me just pick any figure. After initially agreeing on a $25,000 fee, the detective demanded an additional $5,000 to dispose of the body, a first-class plane ticket, and petty cash to buy clothes so he would blend in. This was too much for Sandler. He finally broke his silence. Now we got a deal. Total 25. They told me we have a deal. It was done. And he got upset because it was money. Everything was money. So I backed off of that. Police now had Sandler agreeing to a deal on tape. The two settled on a price of $25,000 to do the hit. Joel Sandler promised that a plane ticket and more information would follow soon. He then exited the car, proceeded to tear up the index cards, and was preparing to burn them, destroying the only evidence the police had. My concern there at that time was that what's going to happen to the cards? I knew the cards were evidence. I knew I had some things recorded, but I didn't have them all. And he was ripping them. I ripped a piece of the card and let it fall on the ground. And he bent over to pick it up. That's when I concealed one of the cards in my back pocket. But even with this piece of evidence, police knew it would be tough to prove that Sandler intended to have his wife killed. He never told the hitman who the victim would be. Police needed something more, but time wasn't on their side. When the meeting was done, I wanted just to make sure that Mr. Sandler was well hidden because I was, there was no doubt in my mind that he thought he, had, he just hired a hitman. Joel Sandler went back alone to his gated mansion and continued to plot the deadly divorce settlement. Meanwhile, the police were trying to gather enough evidence to arrest him. The question was, who would achieve their goal first? In early April 2001, police had Joel Sandler in their sights. The greedy millionaire made a deal with an undercover cop posing as a hitman, but he hadn't yet mentioned the name of the intended victim. That's because Sandler didn't know where the intended victim was. It had been more than two months since his estranged wife, Linda, fled the couple's beach house on the Jersey Shore and disappeared. Suffice it to say that she went underground and that no one knew exactly where she was day to day. And she would call me by cell phone periodically to stay in touch with recent developments. But even I didn't know where she was day to day. Wherever Linda was, 
she had to be spending to survive. And if anyone could sniff out a money trail, it was Joel. He called the banks and the credit card companies, but the trail was cold. Joel Sandler went to untold lengths to try to find out where she was. He would call one person on one line and another person on the other trying to find out. He called down to her banks and the real estate office down in uh, New Jersey where the, where the condo was and said he was trying to locate his wife. Luckily, no one actually gave him that information. But Joel Sandler wasn't willing to give up and he still had one trick up his sleeve. He and Linda were still legally married. He called Linda's credit union and informed them that he was the beneficiary on her account. Linda wouldn't stay hidden for long. They were married. and He was able to reach an individual who was willing to fax him over uh, canceled checks on the account uh, using the internet. At that point, Mr. Sandler was able then to identify names and addresses from the checks and track her down to the town in which uh, she was hiding. Turns out, Linda Sandler was laying low in Sun Valley the swanky Idaho ski resort where the Sandlers had vacationed in happier times. With his target pinned down, Sandler arranged to meet his hitman again. On the afternoon of April 23rd, Joel Sandler and the cop posing as the hitman met at the King of Prussia Mall in the Philadelphia suburbs. The second meeting, we were hoping that he was gonna provide information on the victim, which we knew was Linda Sandler, and also uh, money, the down payment money that I needed to, to get this job started. I walked down to meet him, and he has a totally different demeanor. Something made him nervous. So, how are you doing? How are you? Brian's going to do anything with you. Uh -huh. You need identification. You know everything about me. Identification? Absolutely. I just can't. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean, identification? I, I need. I need. You want me to give you my real name and everything? Absolutely, you know everything about me, kid. I'm not going anywhere with you. That's for sure. Get me. I need, I need birth certificate, driver's license, photo ID. I need that stuff. I can't go any further. I don't know if you're an under. I don't know if you're an undercover policeman. Well, that's wrong. Well, I don't know that about you either. <laughs> but you do know who I am. You know what I look like. You know where I live. You know my phone number. I have a license. I'll show you a license, and that's it. A driver's license? A driver's license. Give me my So what do you... All right, this is ridiculous. All right. Let's hold off. Later. Okay. Yep. Joel Sandler panicked. Investigators hoped they'd be able to nab Sandler right away. Now he turned the tables on them. Had someone blown their cover, or had the consummate bargain hunter found a cheaper hitman? Linda Sandler's life was in grave danger, and the clock was ticking. When he walked away from me the second time, there was not a doubt in my mind that he was prepared to have his wife killed. If it was going to be that day, if it was going to be two weeks from now, he wasn't losing that money, and that he has gone this far, he would do it again. He needed to be arrested. The DA was in a bit of a pickle. He didn't exactly have the greatest case against Joel Sandler. But if he waited for more incriminating evidence, Linda just might turn up dead. Well, we have to decide sort of two strategies. The first is, is there enough evidence uh, after, after he walks away from the, uh, the second meeting? Is there enough evidence of solicitation to commit murder to go forward? Our primary concern always was for the victim's safety. Sandler was out there potentially engaging other hitmen. So every hour that Sandler spent on the street was another hour that this woman was in jeopardy, and I wasn't going to allow that. District Attorney Bruce Castor decided there was enough evidence to make a case, and he gave the order to arrest Joel Sandler for solicitation of murder. On April 26, 2001, the police drove onto the grounds of the Gables, Sandler's posh mansion, and took him into custody. He never saw it coming. He had a shocked look, got a little pale, and then looked very agitated. I think he was completely surprised when he opened the door and saw a collection of detectives and, and police cars. I think we caught him completely by surprise. He was a man who was used to getting everything that he wanted. Couldn't believe that he could be fooled for a second. Couldn't believe that the police were at his house and that he was being placed under arrest. Joel Sandler was in custody, but would the charge stick? Prosecutors had their work cut out. Remember, the clever millionaire 
never once said he wanted to have his wife killed. The arrest of Joel Sandler made front page news all over Philadelphia. The story of a mainline millionaire so tight-fisted he'd rather kill his wife than spring for alimony set off a media frenzy. Well, the story was interesting enough on its own, but when the revelation started to come out that he had had four shoplifting arrests, I mean, you start to see that this just isn't an arrogant millionaire who is trying to kill his wife, but that the cheapness factor and, and the lengths he would go to, to to save money and to flout the law and to not have to pay for things just are unusual. When the judge asked Sandler how much he could afford for bail, he said $25,000, the same amount he agreed to pay to have his wife killed. Apparently, that was all the spending money he budgeted. The judge denied bail. From the very beginning, we knew that our case had problems. It was certainly not a lock. Our defendant refused to speak on tape. I want something done, and I was put in touch with you. I just want to talk any further. Okay. He had used index cards that anticipated every potential question and every potential answer that a hitman could have asked him. At no time did he indicate who he wished to have killed and where she was staying. Our case was circumstantial, but we knew that this was not a case we could lose. If we lost this case, Mrs. Sandler's life would always be in danger. Even though Joel was in custody, Linda was still terrified. Her husband was used to getting what he wanted, and it seemed more than anything else, he wanted her dead. Linda continued to be deathly afraid. It was up in the air, and there would be a trial before a jury, and she didn't know if he would be convicted or not, and he might be set free. So she was really extremely upset and agitated. On January 14th, 2003, more than a year after the arrest of Joel Sandler, a cavalcade of reporters awaited the arrival of the mainline millionaire for the start of the highly anticipated trial. Inside the courthouse, Sean Cullen began to lay out the prosecutor's case. His opening statement to the jury was plain and simple. Joel Sandler may not have spelled out his intentions to the letter, but it was obvious what he had in mind. Cullen played the audio and video surveillance tapes of Sandler's meeting with the undercover detective and presented the prosecution's loan index card. Persuasive evidence, but would it be enough? It was, it was a tough one to prove, but I thought they did as good a job as you could possibly do with a case like that. When you pull it all together in the context of the acrimonious divorce, it was a really good circumstantial case. But to ensure a conviction, Cullen knew he needed a grand finale. He decided to make his case to the jury with the most compelling voice he could, Linda Sandler's. We broke her hiding and we brought her forward to testify because it was necessary. The jury had to see that there was a face there, that it was a person. Two days into the trial, Linda Sandler walked into the courtroom, passed her glaring husband and took the stand. It was riveting. She had never spoken publicly before. And she was very nervous, because that was the first time she'd seen Joel since she'd left him in September 98. Linda Sandler testified to the jury that the long and contentious divorce battle had left her fearing for her safety. The most compelling testimony really came from the divorce proceedings and the lengths that Joel was going to to try to fight that divorce. They did a good job with, with putting it together before the jury. The prosecution rested. But Joel Sandler and his attorney, Thomas Bergstrom, believe they had not made their case. The prosecution may have struck an emotional chord, but the defense contended they never proved that Joel hired someone to kill his wife. Even if Joel had toyed with the idea of arranging a hit, he never went through with the deal. Sorry. Let's hold off. Later. The defense presented to the jury was that we did not go far enough to do this thing. We didn't give enough information to solicit or ask another person to commit murder. His secondary fallback position was, but if, ladies and gentlemen, you find that he did do enough, we renunciated. We walked away from this thing. And if we walk away from this thing before it occurs, that that's a defense to the crime of solicitation of murder, and you could find my client not guilty. But Sean Cullen was determined to prove to the jury that Sandler never walked away from the crime. In his closing argument, he played the jury one of the only statements Sandler ever made to the undercover detective. 
the statement he accidentally uttered when the supposed hitman started haggling about the fee. Now we got a deal. Well, solicitation to commit murder is requesting somebody to commit a murder. What Mr. Sandler did is he confirmed he already had a deal to kill his wife. The jury deliberated for four and a half hours before reaching a verdict. For Linda Sandler, it was a moment she could hardly bear. She didn't even want to be in the courtroom when, when the verdict was read, because she said, either way, it's going to be sad for me, because, you know, if he's guilty, you know, it, it's sad, because that was once a good person, and look what he's become. And if it's not guilty, then I've really got to be in fear for the rest of my life. The jury found Joel Sandler guilty of solicitation to commit murder. He was sentenced to eight and a half to 25 years in prison. In a subsequent divorce settlement, Linda Sandler was awarded approximately 75% of the couple's estimated $4.5 million estate. But for Linda, neither the conviction nor the vast settlement helps her sleep soundly at night. She continues to live in hiding, convinced that even from his prison cell, Joel Sandler may still arrange to have her killed for taking all his money. What made Joel Sandler tick was money and that three or four or five or seven million dollars would never be enough and therefore to part with money uh, was unacceptable to him. He placed a dollar limit on his wife's life and unfortunately for him that limit was set with an undercover officer. I don't think Joel has a conscience. I think that he thought what he did to his wife or tried to do to his wife, having her killed, was completely legitimate because he wanted to not have to share the money with her. To this day, I think if you asked him if what he did was wrong, I think he would probably tell you no. I've never seen someone so obsessed with money as Joel Sandler. In prison, Joel Sandler doesn't have to worry about heating or water bills, but he's still a penny pincher. The police had seized his 1998 car because it was used in the commission of a crime. Now Sandler is suing to get his car back. If he serves his full sentence, he just might be able to drive away in his 30-year-old car. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. Fairytale romance ruined by greed. He wanted to not have to share the money with her, but I've never seen someone so obsessed with money. A divorce settlement turned deadly. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe he went through this far so he wouldn't be intercepted. The thing that concerned me was it just showed an incredible amount of forethought that went into to how you would do this. To part with money uh, was unacceptable to him. He placed a dollar limit on his wife's life. A miserly millionaire protecting his fortune at any cost. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Two police officers in a surveillance van videotaped millionaire businessman Joel Sandler walking through the parking lot at the King of Prussia shopping mall outside of Philadelphia. But shopping is the last thing on Sandler's mind. In fact, Joel Sandler hates to part with money. A shrewd investor, Sandler built a fortune in real estate and the stock market. But he's a notorious cheapskate 
cracking his wallet only for the bare necessities. Now, the millionaire's fortune is at risk. Sandler is locked in a contentious divorce battle with his wife, Linda, a divorce that could end up costing him millions. He feared losing his house, his money, um, more than he did losing his wife. Money. Money was Joel's primary uh, interest in life. And as a result of the divorce, he was going to have to part with at least 50% or more of multi-million dollars worth of assets. Sandler is at the mall to meet a hitman and make a deal with him to kill his wife. But what Joel Sandler doesn't know is that the supposed contract killer he's meeting is really an undercover cop. The police had been tipped off to his plan. A person contacted uh, my detectives and said, Sandler and asked him if he knew a person that could be persuaded to commit a murder. And I decided that we would use one of our undercover narcotics officers uh, to pose as a, uh, as a potential hitman. And what we're trying to do is ascertain is his true intent to commit a killing, and if so, then we're going to make an arrest uh, for solicitation to commit murder. The undercover officer follows Joel Sandler to his car to discuss the details of the hit. I mean, we did have a script in our mind of what was going to happen, and I try to really lay things out when I, I do anything undercover in my head on what's going to happen. They get in the car, and Sandler begins the conversation. I want something done, and I was put in touch with you. It looked like the police had Joel Sandler on Tate, trying to hire a hitman, and that the millionaire's goose was cooked. But this guy was no dummy. If anyone knew how to save his own bacon, it was Joel Sandler. Joel Sandler wasn't born rich. He grew up the only son of a middle-class family in Long Island, New York. Sandler was expected to follow his parents' wishes and pursue a career as a doctor. But after graduating from the University of Pittsburgh in 1972, he turned his back on medical school. The headstrong young man decided that the pursuit of wealth and money was his true calling. That same year, while still searching...